2023 has been a wild year when it comes to the study of UFOs and UAPs, or Unidentified Aerial Phenomena, the new term the Pentagon prefers for the subject. Much of the current public fascination has centered around a series of public hearings held in Congress with several military witnesses. Among them was whistleblower David Grush, an Air Force intelligence officer for 14 years, rising to the rank of major, who then served for two years at the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency at the GS-15 civilian level, which is the military equivalent of a colonel. Grush's claims, if true, are world-shattering. He claims he's spoken to over 40 witnesses, all involved with classified research projects that involve everything from captured alien spacecraft to recovered alien bodies. He's also asserted that multiple witnesses have died either at the hands of the government, military officials, or from the actions of the aliens themselves. Of course, such amazing assertions would need to be backed up by equally significant hard evidence. Unfortunately, that's where there's a snag. And this whole story begins to take on a deeper significance than just one more whistleblower spilling what he knows, or what he thinks he knows, to an investigative panel. We'll need to look deeper into who David Grush is, what his claims are, and what evidence he has or doesn't have. First, we need to step back and see the big picture, especially how the US government and the Pentagon have been in on the UFO disinformation program for a very long time. 80 Years of Lies There have been claims that the US government and its military branches have been hiding knowledge of UFOs since at least February 1942, when an unidentified object was spotted by the anti-aircraft defense crews protecting Los Angeles. It had only been two months since Pearl Harbor, and the country was jittery, expecting an imminent Japanese attack. So when searchlights caught a large, almost stationary object in their beams, a moment immortalized by an iconic photograph that ran the next day on the front page of the LA Times, the anti-aircraft crews opened fire. For more than an hour and a half, they fired over 1,400 shells at the object and yet it remained unscathed, eventually slowly drifting inland and out of sight. To this day, there's been no satisfactory explanation of what the object was. After the war, the Japanese admitted they had never flown any planes over the continental US, except for a pair of lone seaplanes during an attack in September 1942 farther north in Oregon. Japan did launch balloons with incendiary devices intended to start forest fires along the US West Coast, but those balloons weren't used until late 1944. There's also the infamous Roswell, New Mexico events of July 1947. Again, we have an incident whose explanation has never really seemed satisfactory. The US government has offered multiple explanations, totaling five different stories as of 2023. These include the original explanation, that a simple weather balloon with balsa wood braces and mylar-type plastic was mistaken for a flying disc. But the likelihood that the highly trained staff of the 509th Bomb Group, at the time the only unit in the world qualified to drop atomic bombs, would have mistaken such a well-known and low-tech object for something wholly unknown is laughable. After that, a 1994 Air Force report admitted that this original story was an outright lie, though they used the more polite term of a cover story. Instead, they claimed the Air Force had a top-secret program called Project Mogul, which involved high-altitude detectors to identify when other countries, especially the Soviet Union, had detonated nuclear weapons. One problem with this story is that Project Mogul didn't have any of those detectors deployed around Roswell at the time, leaving many with more questions than answers. Subsequent explanations have included a 1997 Air Force report that stated lifelike dummies were dropped out of research balloons and had been mistaken for aliens, though those tests occurred way after the Roswell incident in the 1950s, but somehow they were included in later Roswell cover stories. One of the most bizarre theories was offered by the book Body Snatchers in the Desert by author Nick Redfern where Redfern states that the US government had been conducting high-altitude radiation experiments on deformed Asian prisoners of war, overseen by captured Japanese scientists. There are so many holes in that theory that most researchers were easily able to debunk this claim and move on to more serious work. One noteworthy clue that confirms something unusual really did occur and that the US government covered up the event lies in the fact that all of the outgoing messages from Roswell Army Airfield from October 1946 through December 1949 were mysteriously destroyed, along with all of the base's administrative records from March 1945 through December 1949. This baffling admission was made by the General Accounting Office in 1995 in response to a request for those files from then New Mexico Congressman Steve Schiff. No explanation of who destroyed the files or why was ever given. 
The GAO only mentioned that it had happened probably 40 years prior, meaning sometime in the early 1950s. Those vital communications would have shown how the military had conducted its response to the event, and especially what, if anything, had been transported away from the site, as well as who would have been present for any of the wreckage cleanup and possible transport. While the absence of evidence is not proof of anything in itself, this thus far unexplainable cover-up has spawned much speculation that the government has been involved in an active program of disinformation from this date forward. The Air Force's Project Blue Book from the 1950s took this one step further. One of the men involved in its oversight, Major General John Samford, gave an official statement that since 1947 the U.S. Air Force has analyzed as many as 2,000 reports of UFOs. He said that they had been able to explain the great bulk of them to our own satisfaction. However, he did go on to admit that there was a certain percentage of this volume of reports made by credible observers of relatively incredible things. There were theories at the time, in the early years of the Cold War, that some of the observed objects might have been unknown Soviet craft. It was well known that the USSR had captured a number of Nazi scientists at the end of World War II, and there were fears in the US government that alongside Soviet scientists they might have developed some new type of revolutionary aircraft. Even if they weren't actual flying craft of Soviet origin, there were additional fears that the Soviets could somehow manipulate the American public's growing interest in UFOs, sowing doubt and fear among the population about the security of US airspace, or even use a perceived UFO threat to overwhelm the then-limited telephone networks, making it difficult for the military to respond to an actual Soviet attack. From the early 1950s on, the US government began to take an active, if somewhat hidden, interest not just in UFOs, but in UFO researchers and the groups they participated in. Surveilling US citizens who had not broken any laws should have been illegal, yet we have records showing that this did happen, sometimes to the actual harm of certain citizens. In a few cases, the government, the CIA, and the Pentagon outright admitted that they had direct involvement in meddling with these civilian UFO investigations. Here are some of the most telling examples. In 1973, documentary filmmakers Robert Emenager and Alan Sandler were contacted by an official from Norton, California Air Force Base about footage of a supposedly landed UFO and their alien occupants that occurred about three years later in 1971. The two supposedly watched the Air Force footage supposedly recorded at Holloman Air Force Base in New Mexico which reportedly included Air Force personnel walking out and greeting our alien neighbors right on the runway. Despite early Air Force cooperation on the filmmaker's project, permission to use the footage was withdrawn at the very last moment. The two filmmakers went ahead with their film anyway, which included information on the 1971 event, though they removed direct connection to the Air Force sources from the Holloman event. Following the 1974 release of both their documentary and accompanying book, a parallel story in ufology began to emerge that in 1954, then-President Dwight D. Eisenhower met with aliens on the runway of Edwards Air Force Base in the early morning, and that the event was covered up by claiming the President had to meet with a dentist for an emergency tooth problem. The details of this meeting bear a striking resemblance to the Holloman event. A UFO landed on the runway while two of its accompanying craft flew up and stood by, after which a meeting took place between the UFO's occupants and the base's commanding officer. After this bizarre string of events, a fellow named William Bill Moore wrote about the meeting in a 1989 story with the gaudy headline, Ike Met Space Aliens, referring to then-President Dwight D. Eisenhower by his nickname, Ike. This article whipped up a frenzy about that particular night. Original stories claimed that Ike only was shown bodies from a crashed alien craft, but later retellings include the details of Ike meeting aliens on three different occasions including once with non-terrestrial ambassadors who offered a treaty and an exchange of technology in return for the U.S. giving up its nuclear weapons. The most interesting element of this story is that Bill Monroe outed himself as a government-paid disinformation agent at a spectacular UFO conference in 1989. He admitted in an extremely controversial speech that he had been working alongside the Air Force Office of Special Investigations, also known as AFOSI, with the disinformation agent Master Sergeant Richard Doty, and that Moore's Faustian bargain with the Air Force included him sharing false information with UFO investigators, including the infamous takedown of Paul Benowitz, more on him later. That admission calls into question Moore's publishing of the Ike story, which may have been an early installment of his lengthy disinformation campaign at the behest of the Air Force. It also throws to doubt all the other research Moore has had a hand in, including his 1979 collaboration with Charles Berlitz, 
on the Philadelphia Experiment, as well as their co-authorship of one of the earliest books on the Roswell crash, The Roswell Incident. In 1983, Doty, the admitted AFOSI disinformation agent, contacted the up-and-coming investigator Linda Moulton Howe, who had won an Emmy for her documentary on cattle mutilation called A Strange Harvest. Doty showed her several sheets of paper supposedly of presidential briefing documents about four UFO crashes in the US, Roswell, New Mexico, Aztec, New Mexico, Kingman, Arizona, and a site in Mexico close enough to the US border that the US military got to the crash site before the Mexican government. This meeting between Doty and Howe took place at Kirtland Air Force Base, so it had to have been approved at some level by the military. The story Doty and his documents wove was truly unbelievable that ETs had created the perfect human for peace and love and placed him on Earth here 2,000 years ago, suggesting that Jesus was a construct of an alien breeding program. That's in addition to all sorts of other wild claims, including that the lone survivor of the Roswell crash, nicknamed EBE, was being kept at Area 51. Doty has since admitted to having been a disinformation agent all along but claims he was just following orders, though it remains unclear why either the Air Force or the Pentagon was so set on obstructing the efforts of a UFO researcher. One apparent benefit to stringing Howe along for months was that the pending contract she had with HBO to produce a UFO special was eventually withdrawn, thus denying a possible second well-received UFO documentary for Howe's then-rising career. The year 1979 marked the beginning of the tragedy of Paul Benowitz, something of an engineering genius and an unfortunate witness to some top-secret Air Force tech near his home adjacent to Kirtland Air Force Base in New Mexico. His story began with filming unusual objects over Kirtland, then designing and building his own series of electronic listening devices that appear to have picked up Air Force Signals Intelligence, or SIGINT, passing between the base and the objects flying overhead, likely satellites or drones using lasers to transmit sped-up compressed messages. What concerned the Air Force was the possibility that Benowitz was in the process of trying to decode those messages and that his efforts might be intercepted by some of America's adversaries. Soon, Benowitz launched Thunder Scientific Corporation, which he ran from his home, with various receiving dishes and antennas on his rooftop. Many of those were aimed at Kirtland Air Force Base across the street. When the Air Force got wind of Benowitz's efforts, they began a disinformation program designed to throw him off track. They did this by sharing fake intelligence, including stories that the US had a deep underground military base called a dumb at nearby Dulce, and that the base had been the scene of a battle between US military personnel controlling the upper levels and aliens in control of the lower levels. These stories, delivered by both Richard Doty and Bill Moore, were designed to boost Benowitz's paranoia and were so successful that they forced his family to commit him to a mental hospital, where he eventually died. Moore claims he began his disinformation work when he learned of Doty's work on the Benowitz campaign, but it's hard to know whether to believe his claims or not. The US government going to such extreme lengths as to cause the death of a civilian researcher in order to protect its secrets is indisputable. The question remains if the government is still willing to go to such extremes in order to pursue its current agenda, whatever it is. In 1982, Bill Moore and Richard Doty became involved in another of the most well-known and controversial UFO subjects that of the MJ-12 or Majestic 12 documents. So much controversy has been stirred up by the heated arguments over the authenticity of those documents that they threatened to split ufology to its very core, which might have been the original intention all along. It was 1982 when Bill Moore connected with film producer Jamie Shandera with the idea of producing a UFO documentary based on Moore's research on the Roswell crash. This early collaboration failed to produce a film but the two continued to work together all the way up to Moore's confession in 1989. In 1984, Shandera received a roll of undeveloped 35mm film from an unknown source in Albuquerque. That film contained photographs of what later became known as the MJ-12 briefing documents, including files allegedly prepared for President Eisenhower in 1952 claiming to represent a top-secret agency that reported only to the president and which controlled everything on UFOs, including alien contact and research on extraterrestrial craft. We would be here all day if we tried to cover all the controversy and doubt about the MJ-12 documents. What we will say is that, though the documents themselves appear to be fake, many believe that a group like MJ-12, possibly under a different name, might have existed and probably still exists 
hiding somewhere in the labyrinthian hall of mirrors that is the U.S. military industrial complex. If the MJ-12 documents were a further Pentagon disinformation campaign, it's possible that they were released with the purpose of confusing any future research about actual U.S. government investigations into UFOs. Additional theories offered by researchers as to the MJ-12 file's usefulness include ferreting out Soviet-era moles or even that the Soviets themselves were the authors, intending to entrap possible reverse technology employees buried deep in the vast array of U.S. military subcontractors. These efforts are in addition to the CIA infiltrating an influential UFO reporting group, the National Investigations Committee on Aerial Phenomenon, known as NICAP, beginning in the mid-60s. Their involvement resulted in the removal of famed UFO investigator Donald Kehoe from his director position, in part due to CIA involvement in the organization. This included Nicholas de Roquefort, employed by the psychological warfare staff of the CIA, Bernard Carvalho, who was involved in various secretly owned CIA businesses, and Vice Admiral Roscoe Hillenketter, the first director of the CIA. It's clear then that the US government's hands aren't clean when it comes to the subject of UFO research interference, and is willing to do whatever it takes to muddy the waters and obscure the truth about these events. Current Whistleblowers that brings us more or less to the present, where the US population is clamoring for more information on what our government and the Pentagon really know about crashed UFOs and possible captured alien bodies. Things began to increase in intensity when in 2017, three short videos allegedly showing actual UFOs were leaked to the public. One of these videos was claimed to have been from a Navy F-18 aircraft flying from the US carrier Nimitz off the coast of San Diego in 2004 known as the gimbal video because of the infrared camera mount that took the footage, it's been hotly debated whether this video shows an actual UFO or merely the infrared heat signature of a jet aircraft heading away from the pilot. In any case, it doesn't show the Tic Tac object that the pilot, retired Navy Commander David Fravor, claims he saw bubbling the water beneath it and speeding away faster than a bullet. Two additional videos nicknamed The Flyer for forward-looking infrared and Go Fast videos were also released, though these two have been debated back and forth as to what they really show. The Flyer video from 2014 appears to show the infrared bloom from a departing aircraft, much like the gimbal video, while the 2015 Go Fast video appears to show a large bird flying above the ocean having been captured by a targeting system on board a different Navy aircraft. The two pilots on board this last aircraft were laughing at their ability to get a solid lock on, and the abrupt ending of the video just after they began laughing suggests this was not a serious encounter at all. In fact, just the clearing of these three videos by the Pentagon suggests that these were nothing extraordinary at all, and that they were probably known internally to have prosaic explanations, not anything that could be considered out of this world. Two additional UAP videos released in 2021 were equally as mundane. One known as the Splashdown video showed a cell phone recording off of a command room display on the USS Omaha that showed a distant plane's IR reading dip below the horizon, with six minutes clearly edited out to make it seem like the object sped up. The other, known as the Green Triangle video, was filmed on board the USS Russell and showed normal objects at night like the stars, the planet Jupiter, and a lone fighter jet with clearly identifiable FAA flashing navigation lights. This was debunked due to what's known as the bokeh effect, where a cell phone's iris shuts down so much that the objects being photographed begin to be influenced by the triangular arms of the shutter. David Grush enters the discussion. Along with David Fravor, 2023 witnessed a series of congressional hearings featuring David Grush's testimony. His claims have been sensational, that the US government has possession of both crashed alien craft and bodies, that no less than 40 people have spoken to him about classified military projects that involve alien craft retrieval and back engineering of these craft's technologies, and that one of the craft was transported to the US from Italy at the end of World War II with the help of the Vatican, and that the US officials and even the aliens themselves have been responsible for the deaths of Americans in order to keep these secrets from being released to the public. Grush has been a lightning rod for the two competing factions of UFO believers and deniers. On the one hand, he claims his 40 or so contacts who have told him these stories are all reputable and have important military ranks and government connections. On the other hand, he claims he can't reveal their names, their projects, or their locations because of security concerns. He also admits that he himself has never seen any first-hand evidence of captured UFOs or alien bodies. This means that his, quote, evidence is basically hearsay and would be thrown out in court. 
Grush made his claims known to reporters Leslie Keen and Ralph Blumenthal, who attempted to have his story published in the New York Times and the Washington Post prior to the 2023 congressional hearings. Originally, Keen claimed that the Times was taking too long to fact-check the story, and she and Blumenthal decided instead to take the story to the online media site TheDebrief.com. It's now become clear that both the New York Times and the Washington Post chose not to publish Keene's interview with Grush, though for months Keene vehemently denied those claims. Keene's most recent explanation as of late September 2023 in a podcast interview with Chris Leto was that both outlets did actually refuse to print her story featuring Grush, due to there being, as Keene put it, no proof or hard evidence or documentation being offered. Grush was told by Congress that his classified contacts and other information could be presented to the new Pentagon-run All-Domain Anomaly Resolution Office, but the head of the AARO, Sean Kirkpatrick, says they have received nothing from Grush yet. Kirkpatrick also slammed Grush's testimony in a statement where he called it insulting to the hard-working men and women of the AARO and claimed Grush was never a representative of his unit. Grush fired back, claiming Kirkpatrick doesn't have Title 50 clearance, so he wouldn't have been cleared to look at such classified details as Grush claims he has. Despite the pushback, Grush has his vocal supporters. Longtime UFO researcher Jeremy Corbell, while being interviewed by George Knapp, claimed unnamed elements of the US government and military are out to get Grush. People like Dave Grush coming forward, he broke the mold. He told people how it was. I think it was highly frowned upon by certain elements within the intelligence community. In fact, we know it was because, for an example, the Air Force has gone after David Grush internally. There have been numerous attempts to say he spoke outside of his Dobser, Dobser being the Defense Office of Pre-Publication and Security Review, which reviews and clears what military and ex-military members can discuss openly. And we saw that fail, Knapp continued, but there's another attempt right now by another agency. Let's find out if that fails, and I think it will, because David Grush hasn't spoken outside of his Dobser and I think he's cleared to talk about it more now. Remember when we said he would be unmuzzled? I think we saw that a bit recently, but we're going to see that more. A polarizing figure. On the other side of the equation, longtime UFO investigator John Greenwald, the man behind the FOIA resource, the Black Vault, has his own problems with Grush's claims. Greenwald says there are unclassified files, like his Dobser review file, that could back up some of his claims if he only made them available to the public. All this could easily be remedied if David Grush just released what so many have referenced now in news and interviews and at a congressional hearing. Why doesn't he? Greenwald states that under the new Whistleblowers Protection Act that Congress passed recently, he should be able to post these. 100% yes. And it has nothing to do with whistleblowing on anything. These are Dobser cleared answers. That is not a fact check on the veracity of his claims, but it shows he's cleared to speak about them. When it was suggested that Grush could go to jail if he discussed what was in the Dobser, Greenwald replied, It's clear. Clear. That Dobser document is fully clear. This going to jail excuse is such a silly fallback that way too many are using it in this conversation. Apparently, he already gave these answers in his interviews, so why not show us what he cleared? Greenwald continued, Why he has not released it to date remains a mystery. One possible answer is that Grush's connections may not all be that original. In 2022, a Twitter post by UFO researcher Dr. Stephen Greer acknowledged that he and Grush had discussed the possibility of a government cover-up involving UFOs and aliens, and that they shared similar opinions about the UFO UAP subject. Despite Grush's claims, he never spoke with Greer about his Pentagon or government contacts, although it's clear that some of his stories dovetail perfectly with the stories Greer has shared for more than a decade. Another possible reason why Grush hasn't released any evidence to back up his claims could be because they're all pure fiction that's been in the public eye for some time. His claim involving a crash saucer in Italy that the Vatican helped get to the US at the end of World War II has been revealed to be nothing more than a 1996 equivalent of the MJ-12 documents. Brian Dunning on Skeptoid.com has pointed out that this event has been somewhat mockingly nicknamed the fascist UFO files, since the 1933 UFO crash in Italy is barely more than a footnote in a series of falsified documents anonymously turned over in 1996 to the Italian media, who showed no interest. It wasn't until 2003 that a man named William Brophy Jr., who has a history of falsely claiming his deceased father had a hand in almost every UFO event since Roswell, began to add more unbelievable details to the story, and that it turned into the Italian version of Roswell. Brophy has been fact-checked to be nothing more than a charlatan, possibly with severe psychological problems. 
The majority of the Italian UFO story comes from one man's feverish imagination. If this easily disproved fiction is indicative of Grush's other claims, it's no wonder that no action has been taken by Congress or the ICIG. One area where Grush is undeniably right. During the 2023 congressional hearings, Grush also spoke of a defense industry-wide process called IRAD, the Independent Research and Development System. The Pentagon initially created this process to help military-connected industries manage their massive Pentagon funding. Instead, IRAD has turned into a corporation supporting money stream that's ultimately unprofitable and unhelpful for the government. Only major government contractors can use the program while also getting reimbursed by the DoD the entire way. Dan Grazier, a fellow at the government watchdog group Project on Government Oversight, says the IRAD process has been disjointed for years. IRAD has long been a way for the defense industry to get the government to pay them to develop products that aren't likely needed, he told the Federal News Network. If the contractors can convince someone in the government to sign off on a program, they'll get paid again to develop the product further before selling the product through a Cost Plus program. Even though Grush might have presented some truths to Congress during his 2023 hearings, when it comes right down to it, there are three glaring problems with his overall story. First and foremost, much of what Grush has claimed would either be classified or would be unclassified and therefore unimportant. Grush claims that, at some point, he had the suitable clearance to access this material, but the material he claims is world-shaking is still classified, and thus cannot be released to the public. Anything that he can reveal has been approved in his Dobster file by the Pentagon Pre-Publication Clearance Department and isn't classified, and is therefore considered either false by the Pentagon, harmless or unimportant. By not sharing this already cleared and uncontroversial material, Grush has lost a lot of credibility in the eyes of the public. The second issue is that even after sharing supposedly classified details in closed-door hearings with Congress and after filing a separate report with the Intelligence Community Inspector General, the ICIG, the ICIG reported to Congress that they have not conducted any audit, inspection, evaluation, or review of alleged UAP programs. In short, their only involvement was to evaluate Grush's claims of retaliation, which could include as little as someone calling him a fraud, or being too gullible, or going as far as warning him that he could be jeopardizing actual classified programs. The ICIG, in effect, has said the only part of Grush's report filed that they were looking into and that they deemed credible was the possible retaliation against the whistleblower. They made no supporting statement about his supposed UFO and alien claims. The third issue is the question of why he chose to have a public meeting with Congress in the first place. If members of Congress wanted to know what information Grush had, there would be multiple congressional committees that would have been unable to uncover it through official channels with the proper clearances. Did Grush purposely put himself in the public spotlight for his own gain, or was he truly afraid of retaliation from U.S. intelligence agencies? This all leads to a disappointing but very possible conclusion that the publicity around Grush and his testimony may just be one more massive disinformation ploy orchestrated by the Pentagon. Wouldn't this be an easy way to mess with the UFO community without actually sharing anything classified? They did it before with an unknown figure in Paul Benowitz, someone who was considered disposable by the government. If the government or the Pentagon really wanted to be honest with the American public, wouldn't they release verifiable details from past historical events like Roswell or the 1997 Phoenix Lights event or the 1967 Shag Harbor incident or the 2008 Stephenville UFO or the 2006 O'Hare sighting? When they go beyond hearsay as evidence, it'll be hard for the UFO community at large to come to terms with such disappointment, but it's entirely likely Grush, as trustworthy and honest as he might seem, could just be another unsuspecting tool being used by the government to spread more disinformation. Just like Bill Moore and Richard Doty, having admitted to working with the US government and the Pentagon in the disinformation campaign since the early days of UFO watching, so too might Grush in a few years. Now check out Soviet Union Declassified UFO Encounters Revealed, or watch I Survived 100 Days of the Invasion, Not Minecraft.